you very much, uh, Rajiv, and um, the wonderful day as, as well today. I've attended and I was um, interested to uh, tuck in the debate, but I thought my debate is my, my session, actually my, my presentation itself, or my opinion about it is my presentation. So you can see from my, my title that I personally th think that hyperglycemia is the forgotten enemy. Um, so I have no confidence for this presentation. And obviously, I don't really need to repeat what you all know, that diabetes is a massive global problem. And um, India, similar to many other um, regions with high prevalence of diabetes, is one of the areas where diabetes is a true epidemic rather than the COVID. And you all know, you've been discussing this all, all the last two days, that hyperglycemia is a cause of cardiac, renal, and many other <laughs> not just the cardiac and the renal. The retinopathy, the foot, the neuropathy, uh, have lots of complications. And these complications are indeed the major cost for the person for diabetes, or indeed for the organization that pays for the cost of diabetes, whether it's the individual or an organization that cover their expenses. Now, if you look into the data on retinopathy, you will see that this data shows a very significant prevalence of retinopathy across many countries. Some of it is vision threatening and some of it is not, but certainly it would affect the quality of life and the vision of the individual. And we know that retinopathy, similar to nephropathy and neuropathy, are all terribly related to glycemic control. That is something you all know, it's a given, it's sort of imprinted in our minds about the direct link of hyperglycemia and specifically microvascular complications. When you look again into renal aspect, the top point for a uh, risk factor for nephropathy is hyperglycemia, followed by many other important points. Now, we have the cardiovascular outcome trial, and no doubt they made a significant change in our attitude. But I feel personally that we kind of focused far too much on this and we forgot about the rest of the body. And what after I start my patient on an SGL2 or a GLP1? After mm -hmm. all, I still have a person with hyperglycemia. And I'm delighted that during the ESD ADA presentation, that medication for glycemic management were the first aspect of the discussion rather than the cardiovascular uh, and renal aspects of, of management. Not that this was deliberate, maybe it was, I don't know, but it gave me a hint about the serious importance of not forgetting about hyperglycemia. So we need just to reflect, and I put this photo of one of the beautiful cities in Egypt called Aswan at um, um, uh, the, uh, the south of Egypt, the furthest southern city in Egypt, where the Nile um, is beautiful. And when you look into what is recommended for glycemic management, of course, as mentioned by my earlier speaker, that metformin is not necessarily the first choice, but certainly is very important to consider as a first choice. Whether it's metformin or anything else, glycemic control is very much stressed upon by the latest consensus of ADA-ASD together. You know this information from diabetes, um, you, from diabetes um, UK, UK PDS uh, study that every single 1% reduction in glycemic control would reduce diabetes-related death, microvascular complications, amputation, stroke, and possibly even myocardial infarction. Now, the interesting thing is, when you look into the last 20 years, or perhaps 17 years, you will realize that we have had much more increased number of lines of therapy that were not available to us in 17 years ago. Certainly at the time of the UKPDS, we only have 
sulfonylurea, metformin, and insulin. And even metformin was very new to the United States at the time. And we gradually got more and more medication. Most of them have less side effects for hypoglycemia and for weight in comparison to insulin, as well as to the older generation of sulfonylureas. Having said that, as you can see, there's been no change in the level of those achieving an HB1C of less than 50%, which is really quite puzzling. With all the presence of these options that can give us a plethora of options, nevertheless, there's been no change in the glycemic control level. And if you to look into um, the, this particular set of data of 1.6 million persons, you will find that only 54% from data from the USA, which is obviously a very powerful economy and infrastructure for health, only 54% are achieving an HB1C of less than seven. If I were to look into other data um, from uh, Europe, and you can see it's more or less the same. Those achieving HB1C of less than seven are at best around 40, 41%. So the majority of patients in Europe, as well as in USA, are not achieving this good glycemic control. We looked into data from my hospital in Dubai. And as you know, Dubai is a wealthy uh, emirate and with very strong infrastructure. Where I work in the Dubai Health Authority, the infrastructure is pretty solid. Having said that, still only about 39 to 37% are achieving an HB1C of less than 7. So it does not look like the presence of multiple therapy with all the nice profile of less hypos and less weight gain and all of these issues, or the presence of a strong infrastructure that we have moved very much. I share with you here the data from a survey that looked into people from 12 different countries. This is a survey of 5,865 persons. So let's say nearly 6,000 persons. And again, when you look into the, this is from Morocco down to Malaysia, including India and, uh, uh, and Pakistan. So when you look into those with HB1C of less than 7.5, or not even less than 7, it is only 36%. So the situation is not really very good. And the big question is why? Why, despite all this availability of therapy, as well as good infrastructure and systems in many cases, we are not achieving the level of control. My good friend from Bordeaux, from France, Gerard Rich, has looked into this and he classified the factors into physicians related, patient related, and healthcare system related. All of them are important points that make sense. And I guess we need to stop and look into all of these important points and reflect upon them. Again, the latest AESD recommendations are asking us to think. And when we talk about weight management, it is interesting that this is also part of the center of the focus. But then you need to think of how much time do we spend with our patients? So India here is among the group of less than five minutes per consultation. If I were to go to UK, it's between five and 10. If I go to UAE, it's between 10 to 15 minutes. So whether it's UAE, UK, or India, we're spending less than 15 minutes per individual patient. And obviously, we have no facility to see our patients very frequently. In my hospital, I see them every three to four months, unless there's an emergency. So certainly, the aspects that we need to address, I want you to think when the ADA ESD say, we need to look into all of these aspects how can you do them in five minutes or 10 minutes? This obviously is very important. Egypt here is less than 10 minutes. So it is really quite crucial that we start thinking. One of the crucial points is perhaps 
we need to remember again the efficacy of the therapy. And this is one of the major points that is stressed upon by the ADA ESD consensus. Efficacy of the therapy that we choose, whether as monotherapy or combination therapy, and whether this combination is a combination of oral or a combination of injectable or both is very important. And they specify which drugs are considered to be highly efficacious, which drugs are considered to be high in efficacy, and which drugs are considered to be moderate in efficacy. The other important point is us. It seems that we have a level of inertia. We do not move and to change or optimize treatment and intensify treatment until it's relatively too late. And the data from Cambridge Quinty in the UK and others in Europe is a stark example of this. We start to look into um, um, excuses for this. If someone has kept their mic open, so the time, the therapeutic inertia with delays in time to treat before intensification is quite starting. When you look into moving from monotherapy to dual therapy for people on metformin only, how many will wait until they move or intensify their patients? How many are intensified? 58% of the after six months. And if the HP1C is above eight, it's not many either. And the same would apply for those who are on dual therapy as well. That's, this is something that we need to change because it contributes to the comorbidity of our patients. The retinopathy, the neuropathy, the neuropathy, and indeed all the macrovascular problems are part of the inertia. So the intensification of treatment, as I mentioned, and been mentioned several times in, in several studies, if we intensify immediately rather than delay or never intensify, there's a clear cut difference in HP1C um, and in the level of those who are achieving the target HP1C of less than seven. Over double the percentage, nearly triple the percentage of those who are intensified immediately versus those who are delayed in intensification. I think Dr. Anil, um, Mike is open and perhaps he'd be kind enough to uh, mute his mic. Um, again, I show this slide of the different lines of therapy and the fact that we're not achieving the treatment targets. Insulin, for example, there is loads of types of insulin. So the primary care physician or the non-specialist could well be confused with all of these options of oral therapy and injectable therapy, which one to choose and how to choose them and how safe it is. And this is really the point that was mentioned on many occasions during these two days, the role of education. This is a must because this is the area where we are all deficient in. We have not got many structured education programs that are delivered in our clinics and in our centers. And this self-management of diabetes is a crucial point. It helps to improve glycemic control, reduce hospital admission, improve person with diabetes knowledge, improve clinical and psychological outcomes, and it's certainly cost effective and could all, with all of this, reduce or cause mortality. So self-management of, of, of the diabetes with, with education and support should be embraced and should be given a level of importance as much as pharmacotherapy. We should identify and know how to access these resources and we should make the person with diabetes aware of this and aware of these options and do it at the time of initiation of treatment and again on an annual basis and whenever the social or clinical circumstances of the person change. So my take-home message is hyperglycemia 
is directly related to all diabetes-related complications. Perhaps for some it's much more evident, and for others it is less, but certainly it's a very crucial factor. We must try to start treatment as early as possible, and we must look into measures that will help adherence of treatment and reduce physicians' inertia. Structured education and multidisciplinary approach is very much required, certainly in MENA region, and I guess for all of us today listening, this is probably something important. Finally, I'll leave you with the photos of my beloved city, home city, Alexandria. Thank you.